somebody gave me a book called um, Promises for the Last Days. And um, it's all from the spirit of prophecy. It's got chapters for those that are sad, those that are discouraged. Uh, it's for teachers. There's a chapter for teachers, chapter for pastors, uh, just those that are s struggling with guilt. You know, just so many subjects. Fathers, you know, just mothers, um, just a delightful book of, of promises from the spirit of prophecy. It's called Promises for These Last Days. And um, beautiful. It's about this, this thick. Well, you know, I was looking at the chapter. It said Promises for Pastors. And it said... Um, and I'm just going to quote a couple of parts that I remember. This one was from, I believe it was from Selected Messages. But it said, if you feel things, you know, kind of unraveling, it said, make this prayer. It said, Lord, stand at the wheel. Carry me through the trials and perplexities. Bring me safely into the harbor. And <laughs> it reminded me of a song uh, that says, Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. In Prophets and Kings, in the chapter about Elijah, when Elijah ran from Jezebel there in 1 Kings chapter 19, this statement was also quoted. It says, To wait patiently, to trust when everything looks dark. This is the lesson that the leaders in God's work need to learn. And you know, folk, I looked at that and I thought, this isn't just for leaders, this is for anybody who wants to walk with the Lord. And it says, to trust, this is the lesson the leaders in God's work need to learn. Heaven, heaven will not fail them in their day of adversity. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies totally upon God. You know, folk, you know, you read that, you memorize it, you think about it, and you keep reading it. You keep, and that's what I've done several mornings, is I keep reading it. And you know what it does to my mind? It, it takes my mind from 120 miles an hour and it drops it down to 25. You know, and that's what we need to, that's what I need to do, is to slow it down. I know that's a term you often hear in different areas in the world today. Slow it down. Because sometimes things just go so fast, and we get... You know, we're hitting this and hitting that and, and everything is coming. But to slow it down and to get a perspective, to get a perspective, um, that's what those statements from the Spirit of Prophecy have done for me. And what a blessing. What a blessing. You know, somebody was telling me recently, they said, in fact, it was last Sabbath when I was down in the West Palm Beach, Lake Worth, Boynton Beach area. I mean, you know, once you get down into that area from about West Palm on down to Miami, it's just one, one town after another. And where one ends and one begins, I don't have any idea. No, nobody does, Victor. Well, you know... Dennis Federico, who of course has been here 
and is hoping to relocate up in this area sometime soon. But he and his family are down in Coconut Creek right now, which is nearby where I was having the meetings. He came to the meeting Sabbath with his uh, wife and uh, the two children. And after the meetings were over, he came up to me and he said, he said, Bill, those, those meetings were such a blessing. What a blessing. And I said, well, you know, praise God they were. Uh, I know I was blessed. And uh, he said, you know, I, I don't know why, why it was that the meetings were such a blessing, but, but they just gave me such strength and hope. And I said, you know why, Dennis? It's because when, when we allow the, the spirit of prophecy to guide what is being said, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. And so, folk, what we have been given as a people in the writings of Ellen White is, is amazing. What a gift. What a gift. Well, let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this Sabbath day. We're thankful for the intensity of your love for each one of us. Thank you that you said to Gideon a long time ago, you said, the Lord is with you, thou mighty man of valor. Lord, when we seek to do your will, we can claim that promise too, that we can be men and women of strength, of faith, of, of trust, that you know you can count on. Lord, Continue to chisel, continue to break, continue to do whatever you need to do in each of our lives that we would be those, those men and women of, of indomitable faith and courage and strength that the world will look upon us and say, wow, Lord, help us by your grace to be a spectacle to this world of your greatness, of your power, of your kindness. Please send the Holy Spirit to bless us to that end today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we finished Daniel. want to take a little bit of a turn here for a little while and look at the greatest sermon that was ever preached. Of course, it was on some mountain. We don't actually know the name of it, but it was in the area of the Sea of Galilee. It's the greatest sermon ever given by the greatest preacher of all time. I want us to go back I want us to think for a minute what was going on in the minds of the people that gathered on that unnamed mountainside to try to grasp what was going on in their minds. What was the feeling that pervaded the crowd as they listened? And then how that sermon would impact those that were listening. When Jesus, the Savior, began his ministry, the popular conception of the Messiah and his work was such as wholly unfitted the people to receive him. Boy, the devil had worked so hard so that when Jesus came, the Jews would have, have a totally wrong concept of the Messiah. The spirit of true devotion had been lost in tradition and ceremonialism. The prophecies were interpreted at the dictate of proud, world-loving hearts. Boy, could we do that? Could we do that where we would interpret Bible prophecy 
just to content ourselves with a world-loving heart that didn't involve a sacrifice. Think about that for a minute, folk. You know, I heard a sermon given by a man out at Loma Linda when uh, Francis was here back in September. His name was John Jan Pauline, in which he declared that the prophecies in Revelation 13 and 17 that those are conditional. That in reality, it's very possible that the papacy and apostate Protestants will not be the key players in end time events. He said that it's more likely that it could be Islam or humanism or New Age. Folk, that's interpreting prophecy for proud world. Hearts. Those are Seventh day Adventists that listened to that man's sermon, that enjoyed it and appreciated it. They don't want to hear about Rome. They don't want to hear about apostate Protestants. They don't want to hear about a world united against the Seventh day Sabbath and against God's children. You know, last Sabbath down in West Palm, in the Q&A, we were talking and a a man raised his hand and he said, "Um, I was raised a Roman Catholic. And he said, I'm really not sure what I believe right now. And he said, but based on the questions and answers in this room, he said, are you trying to tell me That if we continue on in in submitting to the authority of God and in submitting ourselves to the fourth commandment and keeping the seventh day, he said, are you telling me that at some point local authority, local officials could come into a building like we have here today and could take us off in a paddy wagon? And take us off to prison? And I looked at him and I said, Sir, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I got the feeling when he asked the question, it was kind of like, Oh, come on, you're not really serious. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. So, folk, we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. When we listen to somebody talk about prophecy, are they in harmony with Scripture? Are they doing it to please proud, world-loving hearts? The Jews look for the coming one not as a savior from sin, but as a great prince who should bring all nations under the supremacy of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Wow. They had no clue what the Messiah was going to be like. In vain had John the Baptist with the heart-searching power of the ancient prophets called them to repentance. In vain had he beside the Jordan pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God was seeking to direct their minds to Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering Savior, but they would not hear. Had the teachers and leaders in Israel yielded to his transforming grace, And I underline that in bold because that's the the crux, the heart of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Will we yield to His transforming grace or will we continue to go our own way? Jesus would have made them His ambassadors among men, but He couldn't because they did not yield to His transforming grace. In Judea first, the coming of the kingdom had been proclaimed. The call to repentance had been given. In the act of driving out the desecrators from the temple at Jerusalem, Jesus had announced himself as the Messiah, the one who should cleanse the soul from the defilement of sin and make his people a holy temple to the Lord. But the Jewish leaders would not humble themselves to receive the lowly teacher from Nazareth. Notice the words, folk. Yield. Humble. 
humble themselves to receive the lowly teacher from Nazareth. You know, I think of I think of the stories of Seventh Day Adventist leaders, the John Harvey Kellogg's, the D. M. Canwrights, the Desmond Fords, and even E. J. Wagner of 1888 fame, and Alonzo Trevor Jones. Folk, even those mighty men of faith, men whom God used, eventually went into apostasy. Why? It came down to these two things right here. A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagoner decided not to yield to God's transforming grace. They refused to humble themselves to receive the lowly teacher from Nazareth. When Ellen White in the early 1900s through 1910 repeatedly wrote to A.T. Jones and said, stay away from Battle Creek, stay away from Kellogg, have nothing to do with that man. He is leading people into spiritualism. A.T. Jones said, I can handle it. I can handle this guy. Don't worry about it. And folk, A.T. Jones went into apostasy. So us maintaining a yielding, humbling, a lowly heart before the teacher from Nazareth. Solemn warning. The devil had prepared the Jews to reject Christ. He had prepared them to receive a conquering king rather than a humble man. The Jews wanted a deliverer from the Romans rather than a deliverer from sin. Jesus had to set the record straight. He had to lay bare the character of those who would make up his kingdom. So this is what the people were expecting as they're sitting on this mountainside, they're expecting Jesus to announce the establishment of his kingdom, driving out the Romans, and for all the people on that hillside to become rich in the treasures of the world. That's what they were expecting Jesus to announce. They didn't hear it. And Jesus' words, folk, came with the force of a tornado. It was the last thing they expected. It was the last thing they wanted to hear. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh no, that's not what we wanted to hear. His words hit them with blinding force. What? Poor in spirit? What about grandeur and palaces and kingdoms? Those words were the last thing the Adventists expected and not what they wanted to hear. Folk, there were Pharisees there. There were there were rich, wealthy Sadducees. There were business people. There were the the educated, the elite of Israel. And they wanted the Messiah to say, I'm ready to set up my kingdom. But there were some, there were some who were enriched by what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These words fall upon the ears of the wondering multitude. Such teaching is contrary to all they've ever heard from priest or rabbi. They see in it nothing to flatter their pride or feed their ambitious hopes. 
But there's something about this new teacher, a power that holds them spellbound. The sweetness of divine love flows from his very presence as the fragrance fragrance from a flower. His words fall like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. All feel instinctively that here is one who reads the secrets of the soul, yet who comes near to them with tender compassion. Their hearts open to him, and as they listen, the Holy Spirit unfolds to them something of the meaning of that lesson which humanity in all ages so needs to learn. Now this is, I mean, there's so much to love about what Ellen White says, but when she takes an isolated one-liner in Matthew 5 and verse 3 and says, this is a lesson that humanity in all ages needs to learn. Folk, that means it was necessary in the days of Adam and Eve. It was necessary in the days of David. It was necessary when Jesus gave the message. And it's also necessary today. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember years ago in Red Bluff, there was a gentleman, he and his wife, nice, nice people. He had come into Adventism much later in life. He was extremely wealthy. We gave a talk on this one Sabbath school one morning and we got to this about blessed are the poor in spirit and he said he raised his hand and he said but but how can I do that I, I've, I've got a large sum of money and I've worked hard for it all my life well see he only equated poor to his pocketbook and I said no What Jesus is talking about is those who recognize spiritual need. It has nothing to do with finance, but it has everything to do with somebody recognizing weakness, need. The inability to do right in and of themselves. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Because it's only those who are poor in spirit that will seek a remedy for their need. If somebody has no need, well, when do you go to the doctor? When you're sick. When you're sick. Heaven is for those that have spiritual need. Heaven is for those that recognize spiritual destitution. The scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners. They said to his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark 2, 16 and 17. You know, that's an interesting thing here because... For the better part of seven years, I knew I had a physical problem. Because when I would walk, I would have pain right here in my right hip. But you know what? I refused 
to go see a doctor? Because I said, well, that doctor, he's just going to give me some medicine or he's going to tell me he's going to cut and burn it and that's how he's going to heal it. So, folk, it's one thing to recognize need. I knew I had need, but I still wouldn't go to the doctor. But Jesus is calling us today to recognize, number one, our need for a physician, and number two, to actually go to the physician for spiritual healing. Mount of Blessing, pages 7 and 8. He who feels whole, who thinks that he is reasonably good, and is contented with his condition, does not seek to become a partaker of the grace and righteousness of Christ, why would a person? They don't need it. Pride feels no need. So it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings He came to give. There's no room for Jesus in the heart of such a person. Those who are rich and honorable in their own eyes do not ask in faith and receive the blessing of God. They feel they're full. Therefore, they go away empty. Those who know they can't possibly save themselves or of themselves do any righteous action are the ones who appreciate the help that Christ can bestow. They are the poor in spirit whom He declares to be blessed. Whom Christ pardons, He first makes penitent. It's the office of the Holy Spirit to convince of sin. You know, sometimes people come to church to let others know that they're good. But the real reason that we want to come to church is because we have need. And we know that only Jesus can meet that need. It's okay, it's okay when somebody is convinced if I'm doing something wrong and somebody tells me, that's okay, that's okay. You know, in our world today, if somebody tells us we're doing something wrong, we say, well, you're doing wrong too. You know, we flip it, we flip it. But unless we're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to say, you know, what you did was wrong, how will we ever have healing? We won't. We won't. Those whose hearts have been moved by the convicting Spirit of God see that there's nothing good in themselves. That's a good thing. It's okay when we recognize that all we can by ourselves produce is tainted with selfishness. It's tainted with self-glory. It's okay, it's good when we feel that there's nothing good in us because then we will we'll look for help from somebody else, even Christ Jesus. They see that all they've ever done is mingled with self and sin. Like the poor publican, they stand far off, not daring to lift so much as their eyes to heaven, and they cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a great position to be in, friends. Because when we come to that place, then it is that God, God will bless us. There's forgiveness for the penitent. Christ is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Jesus repeated this over and over again throughout his ministry. 
He told a story in Luke 18, 9 to 14, where he talked about certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, I find that interesting. There's a connection there. When we think that we've hit the grade, we're righteous, then we start looking down our nose at other people. See how that worked there? They trusted in themselves, they were righteous, and despised others. Folk, if we get to the point where we think we're righteous, we're going to start pointing fingers at Johnny and Bobby and Eddie and Betty. That's what happens. That's what happens. You've got to be careful. Got to be careful. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed, God, I thank Thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or this, this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Boy, he was, he was something, wasn't he? He's the kind of person you want to be around for about, what, 1.2 seconds? Ooh. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all I possess. He was so full, so full of himself, there was no room for God in his life. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the one who prayed that prayer went down to his house justified, forgiven, cleansed, at peace with God, because he asked God to do for him what he couldn't do for himself. Boy. You know that, that statement that the, the ground is, is level at the foot of the cross? You've heard that statement? It sure is, folk. It sure is. The Pharisee was too good to need help, too righteous to need the righteousness of Christ. He had the sanctuary, he had the spirit of prophecy, he had health laws, and he had a whole lot more. He kept the Sabbath, but he lacked a humble heart and he closed it to Christ. He didn't need any help. There was no help wanted there. That's scary. That's scary. It's when Simon Peter, after the night where they received, had no fish, and the next day Jesus gave them a great miracle of many, many fish, that Simon saw it, fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 5, 4-8. You know how Simon did that? As Simon fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You know what he was doing? He had wrapped his great big bulky arms and wrists and forearms around Jesus' ankles. You realize that? And Peter was a strong, strong man. Peter recognized what he was in the presence of deity. And he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am sinful. But while he was saying that, he had wrapped his humongous arms around the feet of Jesus, around his ankles. If Christ had tried to get away, he probably would have broke them. 
He clung to the feet of Jesus, feeling he could not be parted from him. It was after Isaiah beheld the holiness of God and his own unworthiness, he was entrusted with the divine message. It was after Peter had been led to self-renunciation and dependence upon divine power that he received the call to his work for Christ. You know, I was talking with a gentleman yesterday from New York City, and he's really been going through a struggle in his life. And he said, I have prayed so many times for God to give me a certain thing. And he said, God never gave it to me. He said, and I don't, I don't believe that God even hears a single prayer that I've prayed. He said, what do you think of that? I said, well, first off, when we pray, our view of God cannot be that He's Santa Claus. Our view of God is not that He's a sugar daddy just waiting to provide exactly what we tell Him we want in our prayers. He laughed, which I thought was good. Because he realized that's what his prayers had been. Folk, prayer is not for us to get what we think God should give to us. That's not the purpose of prayer. The purpose for prayer is to lead us to self-renunciation and dependence upon divine power. That's the purpose of prayer that we will come to the place in our lives where we will say, not my will, but thy will be done. Now that's the point of prayer. And when Peter came to that place, now it took Peter a while to learn it as it takes us a while to learn it. But when he did, then it was that he was called to work for Christ. Laodicea, we're just like the first century Adventists. We don't need anything. We're rich and we're increased with goods. Laodicea, right here in Asia Minor, here is the boot of Rome. Here is the Mediterranean Sea. Laodicea was a crossroads for trade routes from Asia up into Europe and over here into Asia, this is Asia Minor, Asia's up here, over into the Middle East down here. So Laodicea was a perfect place for trade routes throughout the Mediterranean world. Laodicea was a very wealthy, very self-dependent city. In fact, oftentimes it was destroyed by earthquakes. And instead of asking the Roman Empire for assistance, the Laodiceans would rebuild it themselves. Why? Because they were extremely self-dependent. Extremely. They had extensive trade in black wool, carried on flourishing commercial trading in Laodicea. They didn't need anything. This was some of the black wool that they produced. Laodicea had it all. It was perfectly situated along the trade routes in Asia Minor near the Mediterranean Sea. It flourished amid opulence. Laodicea truly needed nothing. And therein was her greatest problem. She was self-sufficient. Jesus presented the cup of blessing to those who felt that they were rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. They had turned with scorn from the gracious gift. He who feels whole, who thinks that he is reasonably good and is contented with his condition, does not seek to become a partaker of the grace and righteousness of Christ. 
Pride feels no need and it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. There is no room for Jesus in the heart of such a person. No room. No room. There hadn't been any room for Jesus in this world throughout his entire life, had there been? There was no room when he came to the world. There was no room in the inn. The story of Christ's struggles with humanity are centered around these five words. There's no room at the end. We're full. We're booked up. We have no place for you. And so Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is born in a manger. No room. There was no room for them in the inn. And friends, there was no room in the hearts of most of those in Israel in Seventh-day Adventism in the first century. And there's no room for Christ in the great bulk of Seventh-day Adventism and the world today. There's no room in the inn. Not many received Christ. There were eight in Noah's day. There were a handful in Moses' day. There were eleven and counting in Christ's day. Miracle of miracles. There will be 144,000 at the end of time. But it will be those who are poor in spirit, who recognize their spiritual deficiency and depend on the righteousness of Christ to do for them what they cannot do for themselves, even obeying the commandments of God. I'm so thankful this morning that Christianity and being a follower of Christ is not about anything but recognizing spiritual need. And if we will do that, then we can experience the power of God in our lives. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you today for the things you allow in our lives to help us to recognize our spiritual need. Thank you, Lord, so much today that you didn't come to call right people, to call good people, to call pure people. You came to call sinners to repentance. Thank you that that gives hope for every child of humanity that recognizes their need and Jesus will fill that need for them. We thank you today for being a loving, a nurturing Savior that can meet all of our needs. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.